Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. Hey, my name is Roy Canterbury. I'm your host today on Art Shock 101, and I have a special guest with us today. Uh, Kurt's going to be talking with us about his archery adventures, and I'm sure he has a lot of cool stories, and we're going to be talking archery for the next hour or so, um, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Now, before we get started, we'll let everybody know that you can watch this video in the Archer Talk 101 Facebook group. We go live when we record, as well as you can go out to my YouTube channel, learn to fix it yourself. They're out there, as well as you can go out to archtalk101.com. That's where you can watch the video. If you want to watch the audio, uh, you can go out on Spotify, um, Apple. Uh, you can go out to Apple's Podcaster, as well as you can go out to audible.com, and you can listen to our video or listen to our videos, listen to our audios at the time. So let's get on with the show. Uh, Kurt, how are you doing today? Hey, Roy. I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, how about if you introduce yourself and give us a little background about yourself so we can get to know you a little better? Yeah. Uh, I'm Kurt Belding. I, uh, so hunting related stuff. I own Western Obsessions TV, which is a hunting show, um, which I go out and have some cool hunting adventures that I film, share with my followers. It's on Carbon TV, Waypoint TV, YouTube do a lot of stuff on instagram but um my like full background is i i've been an entrepreneur for over 20 plus years and kind of my story is i've again i was an entrepreneur for a long time i turned 40 and i decided i'm not going to call it a midlife crisis i'm going to call it a midlife <laughs> adjustment i don't it, you know maybe it was a crisis but i still not like admit it anymore. um <laughs> yeah. i sold all my businesses Closed, sold, got rid of, did anything I can to free myself. And now for the last four years, I'll be 44 here tomorrow. I've been traveling the world, going on the cool, coolest hunting adventures that I can go on, filming them and entertaining others. That that That's pretty cool. Now, how would they get a hold of you um, if they wanted to watch some of your videos? Um, what would be the yeah. best way to catch up on what you're doing? Probably the best platform is my YouTube channel, Western Obsessions TV. Um, you know, I have all my long form episodes or like all my hunts are on there, but also I do a lot of con educational content around bow hunting and just hunting in general. Uh, there's a lot of educational content too. So hopefully they'll find some stuff they like. Yeah. And we can, we can put um, a link in the description to your YouTube channel and make it a little easier for them to find. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm just going to pop it up here and see if I can get to your channel. You I think this is, this is it. Yeah. Oh, got an ad, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me expand the screen here and I'm going to share the screen here and we can take a look at it. Um, sure. There we go. There's, there, there's you on there. I expanded it out. So this is kind of a first part here. Yeah, that's kind of my um, most my latest video on a little pointer tip and trick. I call them. I'm trying to be. Can quiet you hear the sound? The woods. I don't think you can hear the the sound on that one because I forgot to click the button when I shared the screen. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you, you know how you know how that goes. You know, you, you forget to share the screen and and there it is. Stop sharing. I have I have three screens and it's like okay what did it pop up on next <laughs> so yeah we can we can kind of go through through here it's it, that's your video there and um you have some other stuff here let me go ahead and share that out and make sure I turn on the sound share sound there we go that way we can we can hear it and, and see what's going on. Let me expand this out when you see the rest of my stuff here. And and that is your, your intro video, right? Uh, Quieten and so oh, that's a, a video that I talked about. In the mountain or in the woods um, or 
in a jungle like walking quietly. It's a, a pointer and a tip and just want to that avoid the not, heavy foot, which you don't is think about it often from heel like, to the front of the but that's super important. Yeah. Yeah, so we have that on there. That that's pretty good to start with. And then let's see what else you have. You just click um go up and click the icon there. It should be all good on my page. Uh, up here. Um my logo down there in the logo. That should be oh, okay. There it is. All right, there we go. Now that's where we wanted to go. Is is yep. let's see here. You've got all you got your little videos out here. A lot of good information out here. Yeah, that's yeah. If you're if you're looking to get out there, it's it's YouTube. It's at Western Obsessions TV, and you know it makes it really nice because you don't have to worry about all these numbers and letters. Um, once you figure that out, that's it's kind of nice. You can just go to wherever you want your channel to be. Yeah, you've got quite a few quite a few videos out here. So, yeah, those of you that are uh, interested in looking at some of these videos, you know that those look like they'd be pretty good. You've got some videos that are moving moving along pretty good and have quite a few views on them. And I kind of like how they're doing them now. They tell you I have VidIQ on there, and it tells you how that's doing rated to other other videos on your your channel. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's kind of nice. That's and I know I've talked to others that that video their hunts and stuff, and you think, oh, ought to be maybe found it easy. You just go out there and video. Yeah, uh, it's it's way more and than I, that. I you know sometimes I have a videographer that comes along with me, but a lot of times I'm self filming, and it really throws a whole element <clears throat> into your hunt when you're trying to film and hunt at the same time. It's pretty difficult. It's pretty hard. Yeah. Well, you. I, I did that once uh, this last season during rifle season. I set up, actually, I set up over the top of where my ladder stand was at, um, you know, because they they hadn't been coming through. So I've set up and I got the tripod there. I got my camera. Now I'm just using, you know, nothing fancy, just my my regular phone. But my regular phone has more features on it than most digital cameras, uh, without spending thousands of dollars. And so I've got the uh, the camera on the tripod, and I'm waiting here, and I'm I'm looking. So then you got to get it started. And then you got to let it go. And then I tried zooming in. And of course, you zoom in too much of the camera and it just kind of starts flittering in and out. Uh, oh. So I'm trying to do that video. And here comes the deer uh, on the other side. So I got the camera started and I, and I let that play and hoping for they come over and then two more come running through. It runs off. And, you know, I didn't get it, you know, video they shot, but at least I had a video scene where they, they run off. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, that was, and that was nothing really outstanding is that I did use it to, records the sunrise of the year because i was sitting there facing the east so as the sun come up i got to see the sun rising and you know so i videoed a couple of those but yeah it's it, it could be interesting what all you have to do especially when you're doing it by yourself yeah and i try to give some good high quality film too so you know i'm looking around two cameras to i got a a point and shoot that I use, I call it my kill cam. That's like a, it zooms real well. Then I've got my nice fancy camera that makes all the pretty shots, you know, and um, the a mirrorless camera. And then I'm using GoPro and then I'm using my phone. I'm also using a drone. Um, so I've got a lot of stuff that I'm lugging around. And most of my hunts are backpacking hunts where everything I'm I'm carrying on my, on my back. So um, not only am I carrying all my gear and everything to live on, and my weapon, my bow, but I'm also carrying around four cameras too to try to document the whole thing. So it becomes super challenging to do it, but yeah. I, I enjoy it a lot. I, re I really do. Sometimes I curse if the camera gets in the way and I'm not able to get the shot on the whatever species I'm after, whatever animal I'm after, but um, I do enjoy it a lot. I love documenting my adventures and that's what it's all about for me is just my adventures. Just love that's that's what i'm i'm doing it's just going on many cool adventures as i can you're you're creating the videos for you and if everybody likes it that's fine if if they don't you know you're not creating them for them you're creating them for yourself that's kind of a a nice concept to do when you're when you're doing that kind of stuff is just do it do what you want to do for yourself and and you know it shows in your work too it's like you, you want to do you know good work and and you know document what you're doing you know for others to watch and and get the enjoyment out of it you are yeah and, and sometimes i think about um 
you know, why am I doing this? I go back to my why a lot. And one of the big reasons is I don't, didn't know my great grandpa, right? Like your great, great grandpa, you don't, if you get a picture of your great grandpa or great, great grandpa, you're pretty lucky. Right. So right. my great, great grandkids can now go and find videos of their great, great grandpa, Kurt, and what he does. Right. So if they want right. to, yeah. you know, Kurt is the great grandpa, Kurt, they can go watch a, a hunt that I did in the 2020s. And that this might be, you know, 2050s or whatever, and they get to see who I, I am. Right. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Cause I know I, I have, uh, uh, some pictures of my great grandpa and grandma and, you know, I, I was old enough to remember them. Uh, but you know, then my grandparents, I'm like, this is all on my mom's side because none of, none of my dad's side was still alive by the time I was born. So, um, you know, you get the little pictures, but it sure been nice to have pictures of my, my grandpa on my dad's side. Cause he, he, race the little midget racers that have been cool to have pictures of him actually racing and, and, and stuff and you you can't get that because back then they didn't really take more than just a still you know they didn't have movie cameras like they did do now um and so you know that's what's nice is you're documenting this for your kids and your grandkids and great grandkids and as long as the video is still around then come back and see what you did and and see that's why right. you love what you're doing and yeah yeah, so I'll get inspired. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the big reasons why I do it. So it's always go back and he's like had this nice memorable hunt, and then you go back and watch the video of it yourself, and it's like, oh yeah, I remember that one. That was mm -hmm. that was a challenge. <laughs> no, for sure. And obviously, we have we keep our and some of our best best experiences are hunts, right? So we keep a lot of that memory in our in our mind anyway. And then sometimes we have taxidermy, like you can see behind me that right. will trigger memories of that hunt but now i get to take it one step further and go back and relive and rewatch that hunt and, so, and not everything makes the cutting floor right so not every moment right. is it in that film but i get to relive it again which is really nice right yeah and and we've talked about this on a couple of guys that record them too but you know uh, you know creating youtube videos you know i might have an hour and a half two hours of video and by the time I'm done, I might have a 30 or 40 minute video. Yeah. Totally and and I've, I have to watch that whole hour and a half or two hour video just to see what I need to cut out, what I need to keep. And then at least once they go back and then you edit it again. And, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, create a 45 minute video. I, I sometimes I spent two, three hours at least just to get a 45 minute video out. Oh, shoot, man. <laughs> it takes me on a 10 minute episode, it probably takes me 40 to 80 hours to get that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not real fast at it either. I'm not real efficient, but you know, I probably have any close from 700 to a thousand clips that I'm going through B rolls and narratives and, you know, animal footage. And, you know, so I, not only do you have to go through all the footage, but you also have to put a plan in your mind on, putting it together that makes sense and right might entertain somebody you know so it it takes a very long time to get a 10 minute episode out so i really hope my my followers enjoy my 10 minute episodes <laughs> yeah well and and mine a lot of mine are, are how to videos so actually recording me doing something and, and and a lot of it you know i've had i had one that i i just like okay as I'm doing this over and over and over and over, I'll just cut that section out and, you know, just kind of transition into it. You know, you don't, you don't need to watch me as I'm making a string, wrap the string around, you know, 20 times and start twisting, wrapping the serving. And, you know, I can cut some of that out because you don't really need to sit here for 20 minutes, watch me make a string when I can condense it to, you know, 10 minutes and cut out the stuff that's not important. And That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of fun making making those videos and and you know I've been doing this for you know coming well the podcast uh we're coming up on we're on our third season doing it. Uh this one I think is podcast number 171. So That's I've great. done a few podcasts. Uh it, and it, nice about the podcast is I record them, upload them to the uh to Spotify and it takes care of sending out wherever it needs to go. And then uh, when I do the video, uh, I'll create a thumbnail in Canva 
that I put on it, which will basically have the title and then, you know, what it was about. And then I upload it. And when it's uploaded to YouTube, then I'll put the ending screen on it and the, the little thumbnails on it and, and, and done. I don't, I don't edit the podcasts. You know, they go, what do we say? We say, <laughs> they go straight. That's nice. Yeah. And I do my podcast also. And I used to do a visual podcast where I put it on YouTube and I don't anymore just because I feel like most people like to listen to the podcast rather than watch the podcast. So now I just, and I don't, I don't edit it either. So whatever happens on the podcast happens, right? So yeah, <laughs> and I always warn my guests, hey, if, if there's something that you say that you're like, oh, I don't know if I should have said that. Sorry, it's in the podcast. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like me. I, I don't edit the podcast. And what's your podcast about? It's, uh, you know, it's called Western Obsessions TV's podcast. And uh, I just have a variety of guests on it from educational stuff. You know, maybe it's about, I just had a, um, a guest from uh, Bow Hitch. He does a he has a product that like helps you carry your bow on your pack more efficiently. Um, Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads. I had their main guy on here. Just random stuff, man. But all about hunting. You know, it's all about hunting. Yeah, yeah. That's so. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to your podcast in, in the description as well. So get them out there yeah, and listen yeah. to your podcast. And you know, hey, you know, if we can promote each other's podcasts, let's do it. You know, because it's all about archery. And everybody has a different story, I, I, you know, like, like you, I'll interview uh, manufacturers. Um, I had Thunderhead Broadheads on. Um, I had Tommy Floyd from NASWAN. Um, and um, what is it? Uh, True Ball Releases, I had them on. Uh, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of different ones. You go back and look, you know, over, uh, over 170 videos or podcasts. You know, I've had a lot of, a lot of people in different companies and we throw out their companies and, and then a lot of archers from all over the world. It, it's it's interesting to talk to archers from another country. You know, like I, I've talked to some in, in Ireland, some in England, uh, Germany, um, Croatia, Belgium, uh, South South Africa. Um, you, you know, and there's many other countries. I'm I'm forgetting all of them, but yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, the the stories that you hear from different archers from all over the world. And, and it just, it, it's kind of like we're a worldwide family. Yeah. You have that commonality, right? Yeah. And I've, I felt that too. I went over, I hunt out outside the United States quite a bit. Um, you know, I've done a lot of Mexico, Canada, a lot of hunts there, but I went to Africa a couple of years ago. And even when you don't speak the common language, right? Like their English was not very good. And obviously I could not, I was in Zimbabwe. So I think it's like Zimbabwean or whatever. I'm not sure the language, <laughs> there, yeah. but I couldn't speak it. Right. But we could speak hunting through like a charades or like, you know, we just knew hunting. Right. So like there's a common language there with, for hunters, there's a common bond. It's like family. Once you're right. a, a hunter, you just know each other very well, typically, you know? So, and I found that from hunting all over the, all over the world. No matter where I hunt, whether or not I can speak the language or not, you can still speak hunting, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that is definitely uh something that you know you, you don't have to speak the language. You know, mm -hmm. that you can even help an archer out that don't even need to speak the language because you don't have to say anything. Yeah. You know, if they're struggling with something and they want some help, then you know, you can make, you know, physical changes in what they're doing and, and show them and they can learn. You know, we can all yeah. learn from each other, whether we speak or not, you yeah. know, whether, whether you know the language and don't know the language that we know the archery language. Yep. So what, what got you started in archery? Oh man. You know, and I, I hunt all type of weapons. So I do gun hunting, archery, shotgun, black powder, you know, I do everything, but I would say my passion is I lean towards archery. I like that probably the most. And I think I like it the most because it's just fun to do. So how I got started as a kid, right? So my, I was lucky where my dad and my mom both hunted and um, I got to grow up with them hunting and shooting my bow. And back then the bows definitely are not what they are today. You know, I remember no. shooting a compound bow that had no lead off, right. And no sights, aluminum bent up arrows, <laughs> and you, you're lucky if they had all this, all their fletchings on them, right? Like, 
that's how I started off archery hunting, just instinctive bent arrows, no sights, one fletching on the arrow, right? So, <laughs> um, and things have advanced a lot today, obviously, but I just really enjoy shooting my bow. It's just so much fun. You can get obsessed in it where like, you know, you're down to the micro details and nerd out about arrow weights and FOC from centers and, um, you know, flights with, do I use a three fletch versus four? Do I have a helical on my fletching? Well, how drastic is the helical or, you know, like micro arrows down to, there's just so much things that you can nerd out about. And most of it doesn't matter a lot, but it may matter a few percentage where you add up all those little percentages and now you're getting a lot more efficient at shooting and a lot more deadly. So I just really enjoy shooting my bow. I'll just go yeah. out on a little acreage. I'll go out and shoot my bow um, quite often, you know, it's just fun. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun um, setting them up and shooting and, and there's just so much, so much you can do. There's, you know, if they're depending on what you want to do with archery, you know, it could, maybe you just want to do, you want to shoot a bow and all your only desire is to just fling arrows in your backyard. Hmm. You know, you can go for there. Uh, if yeah. you want to start doing in 3d tournaments or in, in target archery, or you want to start going into semi-pro and pro, and you want to get into Olympics archery. And th there's just so many things you can do with it. And so many different styles of bows. You, know, you got your recurve and long bows and, and compound bows and crossbows. But then there's also uh, bows that are designed for, you know, shooting off of horses. There's there's other uh, other styles of bows that are just kind of completely different. You know, I've seen one. It, it's, it looks almost like a complete circle when it's unstrung. And, huh. and then when you string it, it just bows back. And it's, you know, it's, you know, there's so many different bows. And there's, there's some where the the top is real long compared to the bottom because it's it's so long, you know, it's real long and you don't shoot them in the middle. There's, there's just so many differences. What do you want to do with it? And, yeah. you know, that's the first thing we ask, uh, um, you know, somebody's thinking about starting an archery is, you know, where do you plan to take it? You know, wh what, do you, what are you trying to get out of archery? You know, is it just having fun in the backyard? Well, then maybe start off with something inexpensive and just start flinging arrows. Yeah, that's right. And for me, it's, um, you know, I, I enjoy shooting my bow, but it's, I'm not a um, stick bow guy. I'm not a traditional guy because for me, it's about how can I be as efficient as possible on killing that animal in the most humane way. So if I right. have to do a bow hunt or if I'm doing an archery hunt, I'm going to do a compound hunt. I'm going to have sights. I'm going to have everything dialed in the best I can be to have the tightest groupings at the longest range to be the most efficient. I absolutely can on killing that animal. With me. So that's just, that's just for me though. Right. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, when it, there are, there are those that like to use the traditional equipment, but they know their limits, you know, they might be only, you know, 10 yards, they got to be within 10 yards because that's the only way they can efficiently know that they can perform, you know, a killing shot. You know, some go out farther depending on how much you practice and stuff, why not? But yeah, it's, you, you just got to have to set up the best you can. And it, and if you're not sure how to set it up, well, you know, take, take, ask somebody, um, mm -hmm. you know, the couple podcasts I did before this and when this one comes out to do before it, I, I talked about setting up your rest, you know, how to set it up. Uh, you know, to be, there's a couple different ways you can do it. I'm not getting it now. You can just listen to the podcast. And then I got into the uh, next one and how to adjust your sights and different methods that you can use for adjusting. Because after all, you want to be able to group really tight. Like you said, you know, yeah. how tight your group is depends on what your error is you can have when you're judging your yardage. Mm -hmm. And you just need to know how you shoot at different ranges. Yeah, ranges and consistency with your form. Also, your aiming form. Um, you know, if you don't have a tight group at a specific range, maybe it's a close range, maybe far. It's has a lot come down to your form. What you're, what's happening when you're shooting? Oh you know, yeah, there's some inconsistencies there in your shooting form. It's not, and, and we all have inconsistencies. We just try to minimize it. Yeah, yeah. You just try to minimize, and that's the thing is, and that's what we practice, right? Is minimize our inconsistencies. 
try to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. So you have a higher percentage chance when you have that one shot on an animal that your outcome is going to be kill that animal efficiently. Right. So. Right. So it becomes an instinct and not, you don't have to think about it. It's just instinct. Yeah. You go there, you do it. And, you know, I, I had a, you know, I've got a level on my site. I never look at it anymore. I don't even know it's there. I draw back. I've done it so many times, you know, check. Okay. It's level. It's level. It's level. Now, if I'm on a hill, I will check it there. But other than that, I don't, I don't even realize it's on there because I don't even look at it. You know, I go through the whole process. I have a whole process I go through when I shoot and, yeah. and, you know, being consistent is, is the key. And, you know, whether we're shooting bows or shooting rifles or anything else, you know, got to be consistent. And, you know, that's, that's the point that, you know, you get into, I've, uh, I've set up uh, uh, rounds for, cause I reload. Uh, I've set up rounds for my hot six and my two seventy and, at, when I tested them out at the indoor range, see which one group, my 270, I put three shots in the exact same hole. Couldn't tell there was three shots. And my, my odd six, you could tell there was three shots, but only because the paper was bent slightly more. So basically right. three shots in the same hole. Uh, that's why you reload to get the precision. That's why you go through setting up your rest to be exactly where it needs to be. Set up your sights when you be and practice your form is consistent every time. And you know, that's why we do it. So we can get those good shots. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Consistently, not only that, but like helps with target, uh, panic, tar um, target panic. Right. And, you know, cause when you have buck fever, bull fever, whatever, if you've shot a thousand arrows over the last few months, then things become like breathing. Like you said, like you don't even realize that what you're doing, you're just going through your shot process without even realizing it. Yeah. Right. And I, I shoot back tension release, you know, I've, I've told story when I first heard about it, I couldn't figure out what, what they were talking about. Why, how do you know what it's, where, where you're going to aim with shoot? If you don't know when you're going to pull, well, the trigger goes off. Well, once I learned, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you, you know, the, then, you, then you learn and you develop and every time you get out there, you practice a bit more and then uh, I'll, I'll do some shooting and I'll, I'll look at my form. It's like, now that ain't what I tell people to do. <laughs> why am I not doing it? <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, I got to fix my form. And, and, you know, that's nice about videos. You can video yourself now where when I was first oh, yeah. learning this in the mid nineties, you had VCR tapes. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're recording yourself on a VCR tape and trying to play them back. And yeah, you know, most, most of my instructing when I first started was just watching them live because there was no cameras and the phones then out in those days. And, you know, you just have to watch them. So you have to shoot multiple times now, you know, take one video and we can start analyzing that one shot. Yeah, that is nice about having a camera on your phone is makes it nice and easy to record and recording is, does come in handy. I do a lot of fitness also. And um, right now we own, I own a CrossFit gym. So I do a lot of like um, teaching and training and coaching of CrossFit and the easiest way to teach someone to change a form is by video them and then let them see what you're talking about. Right. So same thing. Right. In is if you're like, Hey, you know, you punched a trigger or um, you flinched or whatever your anchor points been different, whatever it is. Right. You can film them and you can say, see, this is what you're doing. Like, ah, oh, then it clicks in the brain. Oh, yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, there's 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 a lot to be said about watching yourself shoot and and you know after you watch enough people do them, it's like they draw back, they're gonna pull the trigger. Sure enough, they pull the trigger and they pull their hand out and I, like, no, nope, I can tell they're already gonna pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've done that before. It's like you know, find out someone's an archer, use it. You, know, you ask them if they use a wrist strap, and they say, yeah. And it's like I'll give you first lesson free, but pulling the trigger. I say, huh? <laughs> I know I'm doing that. I've taught hundreds of people how to shoot. You're pulling the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and and most times, yeah, yeah, they are. And then I'll go through show how why you don't want to pull the trigger. And you know, it's one of those things where fine motor skills come into play. Aiming is a fine motor skill. Moving your fingers is a fine motor skill. You can't do two at one time. And some people think they can. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, I can do, you know, aim at a point and don't, you know, don't think about your finger, make it move. And it's Oh yeah, I can do it. Switch hands. Like, uh, but they can't do it. 
And if they say, oh yeah, I can, I can do it. Then lesson's over. They can't, they're not teachable. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> so tell us about your, your most memorable hunt you've been on. Archer hunt or hunt in general? Either one. <laughs> one. I'll give you one of each, maybe. Most memorable hunt. Oh man, I've got a good one for a rifle hunt. Um, so I grew up in the Midwest and we didn't, there's no elk hunting in Nebraska. That's where I'm from. So um I moved out to Colorado 15, 18 years ago and started elk hunting. So I got to get pretty good elk hunting. Um Long story short, my mom is a hunter. She's always wanted to elk hunt. So I took my mom elk hunting for her first time. And it was a rifle hunt, first season. So it's in like early October. And we went up and ho I horsebacked her up. We went to, to uh, canvas tents and they had snowed and just destroyed our tents. And oh. anyway, we're having a hard time. And it wasn't comfortable. There was no elk up there because it snowed. And so, you know, there's that big low of, um, of hunting and I mean, I desperately wanted to get my mom an elk. Right. So, you know, I remember going as a kid, I would go out hunting with my mom just as much as I would with my uncles and my, my dad. And, um, we just, you know, I just really enjoyed it. She'd enjoyed it. because I know how much it would meant to her. So we, we made a couple different moves, went to a different spots, um, packed out the camp. Long story short, I end up um, we ended up killing a bull and my mom would just tears and I'm with tears and just super emotional. It wasn't a huge bull. It was a nice little five by five, but um, man, that was probably by far my most memorable hunt, giving that experience back to my mom. Uh, and I, it's an episode, so I get to go back and watch it whenever I want. And, oh and, yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. And every time I do, I just, I mean, you know, I get chills just watching it. So that was by far is probably my most memorable hunt there. Um, so what, what part of Nebraska were you from? It's the Southeast corner by like uh, just about an hour South of Lincoln. Oh, Tecumseh okay. Is the town that I go Oh, Tecumseh. To. Oh yeah. I've been there a few times. Yeah. I, I'm in, I'm in Ithaca, which is in between Omaha, Lincoln and Fremont. Oh yeah. 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 I know exactly so. where you're at. <laughs> The little little bitty village. <laughs> yep, yep. So you just head south, and that's where I that's where I grew up, southeast corner of Nebraska. And I go back. Uh, I went back and did some whitetail hunting this last whitetail season. Shot a real nice whitetail with my bow, and that was a fun one. I rattled rattled him in with a decoy, and he come in ready to fight that decoy. And I was I was oh, that that's cool. I I've never used a decoy when I'm when I'm doing a bit because I don't want to carry all that stuff out. <laughs> in the field <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's it's enough to carry the bow and my backpack and everything else and and then when i was videoing the, the hunt and i had to i had a chair to sit on plus the tripod to carry and fortunately mm -hmm. i didn't have to walk very far because i could drive in the field and park on one side of the hill because i don't get another side of the hill so i didn't have to walk very far but man it, it was a lot of work just carrying those two extra things yeah oh for sure no i i you know like i said i do a lot of backpack hunting so every ounce counts for me because I yeah. typically my pack weighs anywhere from 65 to 80 pounds that I'm carrying, depending on what I'm doing, what my hunt is. And then if you kill an animal, you're carrying out hundred pound loads of meat, right? So, oh yeah. Yeah. Carrying weight. I, that's what I do on most of my hunts. I went to <laughs> Adak Island, Alaska and did a caribou hunt. And that was probably my most physical hunt I've ever done. We did, I think it was close to six. 60 miles in five days on a DAC backpacking and me and my camera guy both killed an, a caribou at the same time and oh. ended up packing out it. I packed out an entire caribou on my back five miles to the shoreline to get picked up. But we also had to go five miles back to our camp. And we started at like 9 a.m. and we didn't get back to our camp until about midnight. So, you know, that's 14, 15 hours straight hiking. And that was, whew, that was probably the toughest moment I've had is, is trying to get back to camp in the dark. And, and we end up kind of like losing camp because I forgot to put it on Onyx. My a pan <laughs> on Onyx camp was, so we're stumbling around in the dark at midnight. It was not fun, but I look back on it now and 
you know, something that I accomplish is a challenge. I'm all about doing really hard things, physically hard things. I, I enjoy that a lot. Not in the moment, typically, but looking back, I'm like, yeah, I, <laughs> I was able to accomplish that. What else could I accomplish? You know, so, yeah. Yeah, that's that definitely got to be fit in order to start doing that kind of hiking. Oh, yeah, man, that's a big part of what I do. Like, that's kind of like, I guess if I talked about my branding, right, is I want to hunt till I'm 80, at least, and the type of hunting I want to do. So fitness is a really big part of my of me hunting. Cause I do a lot of archery elk hunting. I do a lot of mountain backpack hunting and you have to be very fit and very in shape to do that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you do. It just, you know, you can easily, you know, get it where you're not doing as much working out and, and activity and then, you know, steps start killing you and then you start doing more steps, more steps, and then it makes it a little bit easier, but yeah, you, you definitely, if you're going to do something like that, you got to be in shape. His last thing okay. you want to do is, go hiking through the mountains and then get quarter way up the mountain and you still got to go all the way out. So then not, and you're worn out and taking a break. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's increasing your chance of success. If you can't stay out in the mountain because you're wore out, beat up when you want to go home, then you're not going to kill anything. Right. So man, I last year between elk season. So I had an archery elk hunt and I went from my archery elk hunt right into my caribou hunt in Alaska. So I, my, Elk season, I probably spent like 12, 13 days on the mountain right into caribou hunt. But within a span of like 30, 45 days, I lost 30 pounds and I'm, I don't have a lot of weight to lose. So I look like <laughs> I was people that didn't, you know, hadn't seen me in a little bit. They're like, holy cow, Curry, what is wrong with you? Are you dying? <laughs> and it looked like I was dying. Like I, there was nothing left of me, man. I was withered away, but it's hard hunting. It's, but I really enjoy that hunt and i'm assuming roy since you're growing up in the midwest you do a lot of whitetail hunting with stand hunting and there's that's that's yeah. hard in a different way it's not as physically as hard but it's mentally hard it's you know the ruts on and you're sitting in a tree stand from sun up to sun down trying to stay warm not moving being as still as possible mentally that's really tough yeah and and until you know as you get older you get you start getting stiff and sore and then you go to stand up and yeah okay your body says no you're not standing up and so you got to stand up everyone just to keep moving and and mm -hmm. as as you get older you know they're just sitting for a while and even when i was younger sitting for a long period of time i'd, I'd get stiff you know when yeah. i was younger I, I speed skated and you know just sitting in a car for a while i'd get out and i'd look like an old man just trying to walk to like we loosened up and then you know i'm going to a speed event where i'm going to go you know skate to your mark go and we're going to sprinting <laughs> You know, and I can't hardly get out of a car because I've been sitting so long and I'm I'm still that way where if I sit too long, it's like, uh, I get up hard and, and get moving around, then I'm okay. You know, yeah, I can move around more than I can sit. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, and I got, a, I got into saddle hunting a lot the last few years and that kind of helps out a little bit, to be honest with you. It's, it's, I think it's more comfortable than sitting in a tree stand is on the saddle and, and then, you know, archery elk hunting is you're moving constantly right. pretty much unless you're on top glassing but it's the down it's coming down the mountain that's actually harder than going up the mountain i've found oh yeah well just like going down steps it's harder to, to me going up steps because you know you get that jarring and as you get older your knees don't don't like you going down steps uh so i, I start going up steps at, at work and so i'm taking the elevator i'll take steps up but i don't take the elevator down just because it's a little harder on my knees you know, that jarring stop and where I can climb up just fine. Um, now, you know, after the last few months of doing that, you know, it's killing me the first few, but now it's, uh, now I start instead of taking them one at a time, I go up four flights of stairs and take them two at a time now. And <laughs> where the first time three flights it almost killed me. So, you, you know, you gotta, gotta stay in say, shape. And, you know, what I was doing for the last couple of years was, you know, mostly sitting on my computer and, and working from there and, and I like to get up and move around once in a while. And, you know, that's why I, I still go skating a couple of times a week and, and it keeps, keeps you busy. And in fact, I'm going tonight after you get out the podcast, I'm going, going to the skating rink and do some skating for a few hours and just that's keep great. moving and, and yeah. a lot of fun. It's so important, man. That's the big goal of mine is, like I said, I want to hunt. I want to do archery elk hunting, backpack hunting, like I'm doing now for the next 40 years. So 
there's only one way to do it is to stay healthy is stay stay yeah. fit well just to keep my mobility uh, and stay healthy doing it so yeah you def definitely got it that definitely helps um you know in shooting your drawing your bow back too you know one of the things that i did one time is I was, I was shooting 70 pounds and I'd shoot 70 all the time. You know, I'd go shoot a 300 round. I'd shoot 70. I go to turn, you know, I shot 70. I just cut, I locked in my form better at 70 than I did at 60. Just for some reason, it just locked in my form better, probably because I had to pull a little harder. And, um, uh, you know, then the winter, you know, the hunting season started and I quit practice. I quit doing much shooting. I got out one day. And it was cold. I got my tree stand. And I always like getting a tree stand. I like to draw it back, you know, to make sure everything is there. Kind of check out, make sure the limbs aren't in the way. And I couldn't pull my bow back. Oh, shoot. I'm like, I like, okay. And I pulled, and I pulled. I, there's just nothing I could do to get back. I pulled some muscles someplace in my back or, or my arm or someplace. I forget where it was at now. But, you know, so I just said, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit, sit here for a while, either go home because I can't draw my bow back or just sit here for a while. Well, I wasn't going home. You know, that, that's not like going out there. So I sat for a while and I was able to draw it back later, you know, once I warmed up a little bit. Um, but yeah, that was, that, that was tough that time because I didn't do a lot of practicing once season started. I did all the shooting and then, and then after that, I never had trouble after that. It was just one morning for some reason, I was extra cold or tired or something and I couldn't pull it back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's you know, gotta, yeah, gotta keep shooting. And I'm I'm a big advocate of high weight draws. Um, like I have a 70 pound, and the other bow that I have is a kind of mod that I pull 80. And I know there's a lot of controversy around like that, where a lot of bow hunters will say, you don't need that type of weight to kill an animal. And they're right, you don't. You don't need that type of draw weight to kill an animal. No. Um, and you know, you want to make sure you can when you draw your bow, you want to make sure you can hold it for a good amount of time without shaking out of the tree either so yeah yeah but the main reason i do it is because i want my arrow to stay flat as long as possible as flat as possible and because i do a lot of western hunting i don't i do a lot more western hunting than i do white tail hunting because my average shot distances are more like 40 50 yards rather than 20 30 yards and i want that arrow to stay flat as possible because the only time i've really ever missed an animal is when i have misranged an animal um and if your arrow arcs if you're not pulling as much weight and you got to put an arc on that arrow if you're off by a couple yards one two yards you're missing that animal at longer right. distances but if i can pull 80 pounds and that arrow stays faster and flatter and if i'm off by a yard or two in my range i'm still killing that animal that's the main reason that i do it and most bows nowadays have an 80 percent let off where like holding that drawback is no big deal. Um, and I'm, you know, I work out regularly and so I, I don't have any problem drawing 80 pounds. So anyway, that's my two cents on draw weights. Well, and I've, I've seen a lot of archers, you know, a lot of them on the videos too. You'll see them, they'll struggle and they'll draw, try to draw across their chest and raise up. Well, mm -hmm. start with that's using your weakest muscles to draw that bow. And it's a whole bunch of extra movement. You draw back, you move up, gears in the way, or or they're just really arching their back and just pulling and struggling. You're shooting too much draw weight. You know, yeah, yeah. You you've got to got to crank it down and, and build up to it because if you can't draw, point the bow towards the target and slowly draw back like a deer was watching you. You're still trying to draw. If you can't do that, you're drawing too much weight. And, and that that's my opinion on draw weight. If you can shoot more weight. And consistently do that. If you can draw, it, if you don't have to struggle to get it back, go ahead and shoot it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with you, hundred percent. And it's the sky draws, like you, you know, and across your body. It caught it. Every time I see someone draw across their body when they're like drawing down here and like pulling it like this to get it, yeah, I'm just, I just cringe because I might do a video on that. Actually, <laughs> so I might, yeah, yeah, that it. would that would be cool. You're gonna muscle, you're going to hurt yourself. Stop doing it. And I know, like, you know, their mindset is like, oh, I'm close to my body, so I'm hiding the movement. You're not. You're still moving. But um, I don't know if if this is a visual, guys, or you guys are listening to this podcast. I'm a big advocate. And Roy, tell me if it's not your philosophy or not. But here's what I like to do: is when I go to pull my bow, 
I will point my elbow up and forward. I'll, I'll give a little extension forward. And when I pull, I use my lat, my lat muscle on the side of my body. That's my big muscle that I'm using to pull my bow back and down rather than using that little rotator muscle that you're trying to pull across your body in the, the backside of your shoulder. Um, I have found that where I can, and I do a lot of pull-ups. So these lat muscles are very strong. Right. And, um, you know, the, that's where I can pull the most efficiently. I can pull with the least amount of movement and um, in the most weight that way too. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I don't really use the lat muscles because mine aren't built like yours. Uh, <laughs> but what I'll do is I do the same thing. I'll, I'll take the bow, uh, lean slightly forward because it's just draw and stand up. And now I'm going to push my holding hand forward as I'm drawn back and I'm squeezing my back muscles. I'm coming back to my thing. So mine mm -hmm. is in my back muscles because they've de developed a little bit more. I don't come up to use, use the, the lats just because I haven't built them like you have, but I keep the elbow down a little bit more, but I'm basically the same thing. I'm using my strong muscles to, to draw it, you know, use those back muscles. If you come across your chest, like you said, you're using your biceps. You yeah. use more bicep muscle to pull that back and, and not the back muscles, which are stronger. So, you know, we're similar, but, uh, you know, that's where you the same form is there, but there's slight variations the way you do it and the way I do it and the way somebody else would do it. Um, that's that's why you get a, a coach that knows how to figure out which way is best for you. That's right. And yeah, I, I cringe every time I see that against the body draw, but hey, if it works for him, it works for him. I'm not going to go over there and tell him to do something different. You know, so Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you see them, they're struggling there. They're struggling to pull back 50 pounds and, and like, you want to draw more weight? Yeah. You know, I can, I can help you learn how to draw more weight, you know, get them up using the back muscles and, and, yeah. and you know, using the non little muscles, you know, your, your biceps aren't really that big of a muscle. Exactly. Uh, some people it is because they work out a lot, but uh, most normal people, I guess, don't do their biceps quite as much as what they need in order to build draw that heavy weight. When I see people that have shoulder injuries because of shooting their bow is usually in their rotator, right? So, right. so you can put a lot of stress on your rotator if you're not pulling your bow correctly, if you're not using your big back muscles, like right. we talked about middle back. I use a lot of lat, a big muscle in my lat and middle back to pull mine. But if you're pulling across your body, you're not using those muscles and putting a lot of stress on your rotator, especially that backside rotator in your shoulder. And that's where I've seen a lot of injuries. Right. Yeah. 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 Because that, that shoulder is not really designed for that kind of weight. And, you know, if you're drawn correctly, you know, have your, your wrist strap on your wrist. You probably can't see it, but on your arm, you, you go down to the wrist and then you have that little bone at the end of your, your forearm. And then you go to where your wrist actually moves. Well, I see a lot of people will put the wrist strap on the hand itself. That's not, that's not a wrist, it's not a hand strap, it's a wrist strap. So it needs to be onto your wrist. And you can take and if you I've had where my elbow is so sorry I couldn't hardly hold anything, but I could still draw my bow because the pressure wasn't in the elbow. And, and I've shown this before, but if you take a hold of your hand and pull, where do you feel the pressure in your arm? You feel it in the elbow. Now grab up higher. Now pull. Where do you feel it? Your pressure is actually in, in more of your back and not in your wrist. Because now you want pressure on your elbow. You want pressure on your back. So on the hand, you're drawing with your bicep and your arm up higher. You're drawing with your back muscles. And no, that's a good point. You know, yeah. if you're not driving, try that. <laughs> if you are <laughs> driving, make, make sure you, you, you stop. Uh, you, sometimes you stop and try that. Just grab them and just pull on the hand and then pull on the, the wrist. You feel the difference on where that pressure goes into your arm. Because, you yeah. know, on your hand, you're going to feel it in the elbow and the shoulder. Uh, and pull it on the back, you're going to feel it more in the in the back. That's right. No, that's great. That's right. That's good. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of things you learn over um, many years. You know, I, I, uh, uh, become an arch instructor in 95, but I started taking martial arts in, in the mid 80s. I think it was oh, about sure. 83, 84, somewhere around in there. And, you know, studied that for many years. And I incorporate my martial arts. I took Hapkido. 
which is a lot of joint locks and and throws and arm bars and you know learn how joints work and you know when i incorporated that with the archery training you know that's why i teach a little bit differently than a lot of them do because I'm going to work on the body mechanics. How does the body work? And, you know, with what you're doing with your, you know, CrossFit, you know, you need to work on body mechanics. How does the body react when you do this? What's the most efficient way to do it? You know, what can you do to not get hurt? And, you know, all that is just stuff that, you know, we pick up over the years. And, you know, I try and try and teach, you know, I teach a closed stance, but if you don't have my grip, the grip correctly, you're probably going to smack your arm because you got that arm in the way. You know, because it is a closed stance, but it's the most efficient way to have your hand go straight to your target. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you can, we can definitely dig in to go down a rabbit hole on archery. There's so many little things that you can, (laughs) that make a big difference. Um, Yeah. But at the same time, it's about, you know, I don't think there's absolutely one absolute correct way you have to do it this way. Because I've seen some different type of techniques, and as long as you're getting the results that you want to get, right? If you're getting the results where you're not getting injured, you're being accurate with your bow, consistent with your bow, consistent with your shooting. Who am I to say if that's right or wrong? Right. right. That the best way is the way that works best for you. Mm-hmm. You know, right. and, and and when I teach, I'm going to teach you the way I do it, and then we're going to modify it to fit you because you know, like. Like what you said, you, you're pulling more with your lats because those are a little bit, those are pretty strong for you. So, you know, I would teach you the one way and then okay, your lats are a little stronger. So well, let's, let's try this and see if that works out better for you. And in your case, it would work out better. Somebody else may be completely different, but I don't think any, anybody is ever going to draw across your chest is going to say, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that, that's, that's definitely not the way to do it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's a uh, a lot of interesting stuff we can get into. Yeah, you know, like there's a lot of rabbit holes we can go down. <laughs> yeah, you, especially you know, and, if yeah. And if there's a rabbit hole you want to go down, somebody wants to go down, just say, hey, let us know. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go down that rabbit hole with you. <laughs> Something you yeah, want to dig into tactics? Um, you know, I'm an open book. Anything you want to know, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, it's definitely a, a lot of a lot of information we can do out here and plan and and there's there's a lot of stuff we can do in this and there there's aspects that we can help you with so definitely get a hold of us you know I'm willing to help if you're you got a question get a hold of me you know imperative you, somebody's got a question yeah you know, and get a hold of you and I, I imagine you probably have a few with, comment on your YouTube channel that, yeah you know hey what, what's going on with this and yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, like I said, I'm an open book and I do a lot of hunt mentoring too. So, you know, and that's, that was the big thing for me is coming from Nebraska to Colorado, going from hunting creek, creek lines and small woods in Nebraska where you just, you just know where the whitetail are. It's not right. too hard to get out, right? Then you come out to Colorado where it's thousands and thousands of public land in the mountains where like, it's like, trying to find a needle in a haystack and trying to find an elk. <laughs> so yeah, I know what it's like to not have that mentor um, and how big that learning curve is. So a mentor will help a lot, cut that learning curve down years to be successful. So, you know, reach out to me, just search Western Obsessions TV, whether it be my Instagram, YouTube, um, you know, any any platform that I'm on and I'm more than willing to help. Yeah, that sounds sounds like a, a good plan for those who want some help. You know, get a hold of it. You know, like I said many times, the only stupid question is one you haven't asked. I like because once you ask it, it's not a stupid question because it was your question. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, of course, I say it's like if you keep asking the same question over and over and over, we might we might have to do something different because you're not understanding what we're saying. So I have to change to what I'm answering or way I'm answering. You know, and we've done that. You know, it's like not not catching on and. Um, then all of a sudden the light bulb goes on. You know, like I said, when you watch a video of yourself, light bulb goes on. It's like, oh, that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm doing wrong. Yep. 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 That's good. 
So where do you, where do you see um, your archery in the next few years? Where you plan on taking that? Uh, yeah, I don't see it being a lot different than what I'm doing now. Um, as you guys can probably tell, I use a lot of fitness in my hunting and I use a lot of fitness in my archery too. So, uh, some things that I do that maybe other people don't do is I'll do high stress shooting where I'll do, um, workout. I'll work out while I'm shooting my bow. So I may do put together a workout, like I'm going to do 10 squats you know, 15 burpees, 10 kettlebell swings, and I'm going to take a shot with a high heart rate. Um, and for me, what that simulates is buck fever. That simulates um, Western style hunting where you've had to put on a stock and you're winded and now it's time to take the shot, calming yourself down, calming your heart rate to make a good shot. So that's something I do a little bit different in archery than maybe most of like Midwest or whitetail hunters don't do. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of hunts that I still want to go on, a lot of adventures I want to go on. So I see myself doing a lot of different archery hunts. You know, I archery elk hunt pretty much every year. So that's kind of, I call that my Super Bowl. That's what I train for all year long is that very physical, intense archery elk hunt. Um, but I've done a lot of other archery hunting. I went to Mexico, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and hunted oscillated turkey, brocket deer with my bow, shot a, a Cuda Monday down there. I've shot pronghorn, you know, obviously deer, um, you know, I did a, a bear in Saskatchewan with my bow, um, moose hunted with my bow. Like I, I usually pick my bow first and my and gun second, but uh, some other things I'd like to, you know, there's a lot of adventure still for me to have and Alaska's on that bucket list. So I want to do more caribou hunting. Um, I actually pulled a mountain goat tag for this season. So uh, we'll see how that goes in Alaska. I'm excited about that. But um, yeah, I guess what you can expect is me to continue working out hard, staying in shape, practicing with my bow to be very efficient at killing whatever animal I'm at, I'm after, and going on a lot more hunting adventures. What's what's the number one hunt that you're you're wanting to get off your bucket list? It's probably a, a mature bull caribou is probably my number one hunt. And I know a lot of guys is like, you know, the bighorn ram is their, is their bucket list hunt. And of course I'd love to do that. Just I'm a blue collar guy and, and those are very expensive hunts. So unless I, <laughs> a tag, which is like a once in a lifetime tag and it takes, you know, 30 plus years of, of flying to draw that. Uh, I don't get excited about it because I probably will never go, but a caribou hunt in Alaska is something that it's still possible. And I'm just fascinated by those big C curved antlers that they have. And, you know, I killed a young bull uh, last year in Adak Island in Alaska. And uh, the meat is fantastic. It's, oh. I love elk meat, but I would say caribou is almost better than elk meat. Fantastic meat. Um, so definitely that big bull caribou is on the top of my bucket list. Yeah, I haven't really had much. That I had moose. I went up to Canada, uh, moose hunting one year, and 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 got a, a moose, and that was really good meat. Yeah, moose is really good too. Absolutely. I don't know how it compares to caribou and and and, and elk because I haven't shot any of those yet, so I don't have those to compare against. But that moose was really really good. It was. Uh, I think it was a lot of meat too. <laughs> oh yeah, you do. You get a lot of meat. <laughs> Yeah. There's there's a lot of meat. I know um I had over 500 pounds. You know, I brought it back in coolers and is over 500 pounds worth of uh, meat and bones. Um yeah. the the head and hide weighed about 130 pounds. <laughs> that was just the hide and the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. God dang. They're big animals. Yeah. I've not yet shot a moose. I I archery hunted. For moose in uh, Alberta, but we it was not successful. But they're big animals, man, and and they look they're fantastic. I I don't know that that's definitely going to be a bucket list to hunt too. But caribou just it comes above that for some reason for yeah. me. Yeah, that's, yeah, caribou would be nice. That would be nice to to go on a caribou hunt. I'd have to get a little bit better shape, you know. Um, 
about time this podcast comes out, I'm almost 69. So um, <laughs> a little harder yeah. to stay in shape as you, as you get older. And You know, 100%, I get it. And 69 is still hunting. That's great. Yeah. Well, st still working, still skating. It's, you know, it's yeah. the only way to stay, stay young is to keep moving. And, you know, the last couple of years when I was, you know, mostly working at home and it's like, yeah, that took a toll. And it's like, it's work coming back from it. Yeah. You just don't recover as, as well as you do when you're younger. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your, your body hurts more, a little bit more, but you know what? It hurts. Do it again. It hurts. Do it again. It still yeah. hurts. Well, do it again. Oh, yeah. Don't hurt so bad. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be exciting to get on a, a caribou hunt up in Alaska. That would be, that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I've, you know, when I first started my midlife crisis, I wanted to go on every hunt imaginable. I just wanted to do everything. And now I'm kind of realizing, you know, there's a lot, obviously I want to do everything, but there's a limit, right? I only have so much money yeah. to do it. And I can only spend so much time away from my family each year. So now I'm very picky on what hunts I go on uh, because of time and money, right? So it doesn't matter. Like I could go here in Colorado, the mountains and do an archery elk hunt over the counter, which the tag cost me 50 bucks, but I still end up spending a thousand dollars in that hunt because of gas and food and you know it's it it adds up really fast yeah um, so every hunt that i go on i'm spending you know a thousand bucks and then some of them i've gone on outfitted hunts that are up closer to that five to seven thousand dollars and um yeah i guess it gets expensive and then you got to be really careful especially if you have a family and how much time you're spending away so now i'm very picky on what hunts i go on and they have to really excite me, really excite me. From yeah. On. yeah. You know, that way it makes it a little more special. Yeah. And it's all special, man. I love being out in nature, um, having that adventure. And that's what it is for me is the adventure. You know, I can have an adventure sitting up in a tree, whitetail hunting, you know, because there's really cool adventures that happens. You can have a fox run below you or some other wildlife you get to watch or, um, you know, just spending time in the in the woods is fantastic. Or you can go to Alaska on a caribou hunt and, or a mountain goat hunt this year that I'll be going on. And, you know, for me, that's like an ultimate adventure too, right? So they're all adventures in my book. Yeah, you, you have a bird land on a branch next to your foot and, or, or mm -hmm. on you. I mean, hey, land yeah. on me. I, I've talked to other guys that, you know, the bird just landed on their shoulder. They just kind of looked at it like, oh, okay, <laughs> sit there and. And the next thing you know, they they fly off and they thought you was a branch and they just landed on you. And, and yeah, you, you see a lot of them. And and then the the cool ones is when you're up before the sun comes up and you got your bow hanging in the tree and, and you start seeing the sun come up and all the frost starts forming on everything, your bow and the branches. And, and you know, your bow's got frost on it now, but you don't care because it's cool. <laughs> it's cool yeah. looking. You get a nice real view and, and it, you know. I think I took a picture of it, but whatever took it big, I don't have it anymore. But, um, you know, I got the picture up here, you know, of that morning when it was, you know, all the frost was forming on all the branches and it just looked so neat. And on the way home, there, there used to be a bunch of row of evergreen trees and I come when I'm driving home, they're all frosted over, you know, like you frost your Christmas trees and stuff. You know, that's like a whole row of those there. And, and, you know, it's one of those things that you don't forget and, Nope. And that's, you know, I guess as a hunter talking to anybody that might be a non-hunter, they, if they trying to understand why we do what we do and maybe they can't get past the killing of an animal part, but it's for me, that's not even, re I mean, that's the goal in mind that I'm trying to do, but the 95% of the enjoyment is the pursuit of the animal. That's the adventure for me. It's what's over that next ridge oh man, I'm back someplace I've never been. I'm exploring a new area. I saw some cool wildlife or just having that adventure is really what it's all about for me. And if I end up killing an animal, because that's my the goal that I had in mind, that's just icing on the cake. Yeah. Well, I had one guy one time that did a lot of uh, hunting and used to do rifle. Now he, you know, switched to bow and he's going, you know, for the you know, the grand slam ball that, you know, big game animals and, and stuff. And, and, uh, he said, somebody asked him one time, what's the difference between a rifle hunter and a bow hunter? 
And he says, your time you spent with the animal. Pre-hunt, no matter what weapon it is, is the same amount of time. Kill the animal to going out, the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. Except with a rifle, you might go up there and it's like your first day. You're up there and you see this, this, the animal 100 yards, the rifle, that's, that's, you know, chip shot. Um, except for us bow hunters that think it's a long shot, but <laughs> you know, that's a different story. And, and then you shoot the animal and your hunt's done. Well, the bow hunter 100 yards away, we're trying to get closer to it. So you might spend, you know, three, four days getting close enough to it to make a shot. So mm -hmm. that's why he said the time you spend hunting the animal is the only difference. No, that's a good point. And that's, there's a lot to be said with that. And getting very personal with that animal up close and personal and you got to get in its kitchen, right? Like you got to get in its bedroom to, right. to make that shot or get close enough for a shot. So. Well, when you're close enough to it that you can see the broadhead change in the hair color as it goes into the deer, <laughs> you, you know you're close. <laughs> yeah, you're close. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. I, I've seen it as like, oh, I know exactly where it hit. I can see the arrow change. The color changed from, from the, the reddish color to the gray color. You know, it's like you see right where it hit because you cut through that outside layer of hair. And so... You know, that's close. And that's pretty when close. You, when you get them in that close. And, you know, that's why I've had I've had shots at deer, you know, in the past, you know, with the rifle. It's like, oh, that's too far away. There's only 100 yards. The rifle, that's nothing. Yeah, it's pretty close for the rifle. Yeah. Yeah. Especially my, my new Hot 6. I got it sighted in 200 yards. I'm dead on. So I'm within three inches out to 300 yards. So I just put cross the road at the go and squeeze. As long as I'm within 300 yards, I don't care. Um, mm. you can't do that with a bow, you know, I'm, I'm more in your 20 to uh, 20 yard to 30 yards shots, what I'm going to go for. Um, as I get older, I, I can't see as well. So I don't take those longer shots anymore. So I can't see yeah. my pins well enough. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, you've talked about se several of your different hunts, you know, having, you know, exciting hunts, challenging hunts and, uh, it, it's, it's all what, besides taking your mom out hunting, uh, what other person have you taken out that's been really exciting and see how they, they grow as a hunter? My daughter, I take my daughter out on hunts and I really enjoy that too. Um, and as, if you guys know, when you take someone else on a hunt and they're successful, you, it's almost like you get more pleasure out of that than you do hunting on your own. So then taking out your, my daughter, I get to spend time with my daughter and she's a teenager now. So I get to spend time with my daughter and actually have good conversations because there's no cell service. Um, right. Yeah. Um, and she's stuck with me and she has to talk with me. So, uh, and those are moments that you'll just, you know, cherish that you would never have any other way than going out in a remote world on a mountain with no cell service, just hanging out you and me and my daughter. Right. So those hunts are really special to me. And she's a, man, she's a killer. She's a very good shot. Uh, she's killed an elk. She's killed deer. She's killed turkey. Uh, she's 14. Um, this year, we may, I think I can draw a first rifle elk tag and give her a really good chance for a big bull. But it's a, it's going to be a hard hunt. This is going to be the hardest hunt that she would be going on at date. So I've always kind of kept it easy hunts for her because I, I didn't want her to have a, a bad time where she didn't want to go hunting. So it's, you know, turkey right. hunts are fun. Uh, some deer hunts where we don't, don't have to do a lot of hiking. It's a lot of like driving and glassing and, and that type of stuff, you know, whitetail hunts where we're sitting in the, in a tent blind for just a couple hours and it's no big deal. Right. So, uh, but this one is going to be a, a backpacking backwoods elk hunt with a, with a rifle. Um, but so it's going to be, you know, camping in tents and living on freeze dried food and boiling, <laughs> you know, filtering your water. And it's going to be a, a legit hunt. So um, I hope, I really hope that she enjoys it. I hope we get on some elk and she gets excited. And, um, but we'll see, man. It's, you know, you never know with those hard hunts, how your kid's going to do with it, you know? Yeah, you never know. We'll have to have her on the podcast and talk about her uh, when she gets back. Yeah, it's uh, if, you know, I'm going to ask her in April is the draw for Colorado. So I'll sit down and have a conversation with her. Okay, you sure you want to do this? And if she's all about it, she should draw that tag and 
and we'll go in October. That's when she would go. That that'd be cool. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to hear her story if if you end up going on it. I like to hear her story of her adventures on going on that first really hard hunt. Yeah, well, and she doesn't like it when I film and hunt because it screws up the hunt sometimes, right? So oh, <laughs> if I'll, I'd love to film it and get it as a as an episode. And maybe I can talk her into letting me do it. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Well, you, you may have to, you know, make it make a deal. It's like, okay, if it comes down to getting a video or you're getting the shot, take the shot. You know, we'll we'll figure out the video after. We'll create a yeah. B-roll and uh, of what you've done afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I've screwed up a hunt for her while I was filming. It was a deer hunt and with a crossbow. And so ever since then. She's like, no, dad, I don't want you to film. You screw up the hunt. So like, <laughs> you know, so. All right. Well, we'll see if I can talk her. Into it. How'd you mess up the hunt for her? We're sitting up in a tree stand and uh, a couple younger bucks came in, but nice bucks. And um, I, we, I don't use a crossbow, so I don't know much about them. So I was borrowing it from a buddy and uh, she, she had the cry, gave her the crossbow. I, was messing with my camera, trying to get the, the deer in the frame. I said, okay, you go ahead and take the shot. And she went to take the shot and nothing happened. I'm like, oh crap, I left it on safety. So I put it off safety. Okay, go make the, take the shot. She did it again. Nothing happened. And I couldn't, I'm like, what's wrong with it? And it ended up where the bolt wasn't far enough back to allow the trigger mechanism to fire. Oh, so, the deer and I'm messing with the camera and she's yeah so in her mind it was I screwed it up because I wasn't paying attention to what's going on with her and the crossbow I was paying attention with the camera so I don't know she's older now and she knows how to shoot so maybe maybe we'll be okay yeah lo load your own arrow so it's her fault if it doesn't go off yeah yeah right. so the crossbows they have that safety and if you don't have it back all the way it won't right. allow the trigger to engage to release it because otherwise you'd end up dry firing if, it, if it's not all the way back or no no arrow, uh, then you dry fire it. And crossbows, you get dry one dry fire, and then they blow up. Yeah, and they yeah, just yeah. like a regular bow will blow up, but for sure a crossbow will. But uh, yeah, and I didn't know that right. So and it was just barely not far enough back where it wouldn't go oh, off. So yeah, just barely, and it, you couldn't tell by just looking at it. Like you just had to like pop it back in there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, she missed it so well that's a lesson learned that's a lesson if it doesn't learned. go off make sure it's back all the way and yep so that that won't happen again <laughs> but you know what she like a month later we went and hunted nebraska white tail she hit she shot a big old five point her first deer with big old five point white tail and I'm like okay is that we're good now we got you a big deer and she's like nope you still screwed up that one in oklahoma <laughs> 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 you're not going to live that, that down for a long time not going to live it down <laughs> 20 years from now she's still going to accuse you of messing up that one hunt messing up that one hunt i know <laughs> <laughs> just like a hunting buddy of mine was i had this real small um, eight point buck come in the, the rack couldn't have been more than about three inches tall but it was like a perfect shaped one skinny body and i'm looking at it, it's like it don't look like it's sick or nothing. It just looks like a, a young buck with a nice rack starting on it. And I'm sitting there. I, I wasn't going to shoot it, but I'm sitting there and hunting partner got decided he was going to done hunt and he'd come walking up and scares him off. So I, I tell him all the time, oh, you scared off my my uh, eight point buck by walking up. <laughs> I was going to shoot it anyway, but, you know, <laughs> you know, that's one of those things you, you can always, always accuse. Him. Remember that time you come walking up? Then I had another time. You know, a funny story that he shot a deer and it come run up past me and it head butted a tree. It dead run, it died, dead run, and then head butted the tree and then fell over. Oh geez. <laughs> and like, okay, I'm still that that I thought that was kind of funny. It's like all of a sudden the deer comes running up, you know, full speed and then runs into the tree and falls over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, funny things happen like that, and and mm. you know, you just you just gotta enjoy, like you said, enjoy your time in the field and and you know, get to see all the things that you know people don't see that aren't hunters, you know, or at least bow hunters anyway. 
because you know a lot of the other hunting you do you know like with the pheasants and and you know rivals and other stuff like that you're not sitting still so you don't get to see and hear you know the things going on in the forest you know like all the birds and, and rabbits and squirrels are scurrying around and all of a sudden they got dead quiet it was like they all went to bed <laughs> all went to sleep all at the same time just completely quiet forest <laughs> That's right, man. Those yeah. kind of the, the cool times. Yeah, you see some really cool things out in the woods that you would never experience, you know, in a town or city or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it just it's just so much fun being out. And it's it's that's why we do it, right? <laughs> that's why we do it for the adventure. That's why I do it in. Well, remind everybody the ways they can get a hold of you. You know, those that are still listening, I want to remember. You know, remind them, you know, how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, just search Western Obsessions TV and you'll find it. But I'm most active on my Instagram account. Um, I do have a Facebook page. That's where Roy found me. Um, and um, my Facebook page is just Kurt Belding. And then YouTube, I, I put out a lot of content on YouTube. So Western Obsessions TV on, on YouTube. Or you can just go to my website, westernobsessionstv.com and find all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'll put links in the descriptions to make it easier for those uh, that are listening to just go in the description of the, the podcast and uh, we'll, we'll uh, have the links there and make it easier to find you. Sounds great. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, it, it's it's been real enjoyable talking with you. I, I know this has been this has been a lot of fun for me and hopefully it's a lot of fun for you and, and our listeners. I'm sure they got a lot of cool stories. And and like like we both said, if you have any questions, get a hold of us. Uh, you, you can get a hold of us, you know, in the places that Kirk just mentioned, or you can get a hold of me through Archer Talk 101 Facebook group. Uh, you can get a hold of me on my YouTube channel, Learn to Fix It Yourself, because I have not just videos on, on archery, but I have all kinds of other stuff. You know, there, there's something for everybody out there. Um, you know, I'm trying to spread my knowledge of, you know, 60 years of doing stuff and, and you know, just teach you how to do stuff. And that's why I call it Learn to Fix It Yourself. Um, you know, get a hold of us, you know, be glad to help. So thanks for being on the show. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, when your daughter gets on that hunt, you know, let's book at a time and have, get her on here. And, and so we like can hear about her story of her, her first real hard hunt, how it turned fun. out. Yeah. I'm sure she'll like that. Yeah, I'm sure she will. If not, we'll get her on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get, get her talking about her hunt. She don't sugarcoat anything. So if, if she didn't enjoy it, she's going to let you know too. <laughs> and I, I don't expect anybody to sugarcoat it. You know, tell it like it is. Um, yeah. You know, if you didn't have fun in it, hey, we want to hear why you didn't have fun. You know, you didn't have fun. Well, let's hear it. Maybe somebody else can not have, have fun, but not have it so bad. <laughs> well, my name is Roy Canterbury. I've been your host today on Arch Talk 101. And uh, Kurt Belding has been our guest today, and we had a lot of fun today. And make sure you catch us on the next one. Uh, we're, we're out there all over the place, and make sure you catch us, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>